computers running Windows 7 and put them side by side. The computer on the right will provide remote assistance to the computer on the left. Before you can start using remote assistance, you need to make sure that it is first configured. To do this, open the control panel and select the option System and Security. From inside System and Security, select the option Allow Remote Access. In order for the computer on the left to receive remote assistance, the tick box at the top Allow Remote Assistance Connection to this computer must be ticked. If you open the Advanced Options, you can first configure whether this computer can be controlled remotely or not. Permission still needs to be given before a remote party can control the desktop. However, if this setting is not set, they won't be able to control the desktop under any circumstances. The next section determines how long the invitation will last. This may be minutes, hours, or even days. Once the invitation has expired, it will no longer be able to be used. Invitations can be used more than once, so it is not uncommon for people who provide assistance to other users on a regular basis to set this value quite high so invitations do not have to be recreated very often. The last option, when enabled, will limit the computers that can connect to Windows Vista or above. There have been some protocol improvements in Windows Vista to remote assistance, so I would select this option where possible. Remote assistance is now configured. If I exit out, I can now run Windows Remote Assistance from the Start menu. Before another person can connect to this computer using Remote Assistance, you have to have an invitation. From the wizard, select the option Invite Someone You Trust to help you. On the next screen, you will need to determine how the Remote Assistance invitation will get to the other party. The first option simply lets you save the invitation to a file. The second option will email the invitation to the other party. The last option will use Easy Connect. Remember that Easy Connect requires IP version 6 to work. In this example, I will select the first option and save the invitation to a file share that both computers have access to. Now that the invitation has been created, Windows will give you a password. This password needs to be entered in on the other computer. Now that the invitation has been created, I will run Windows Remote Assistance on the right computer. From the wizard, I will select the option Help Someone Who Has Invited You. On this screen, I will select to open the invitation file that I saved to the file server. Once open, you can see that I have been asked for the password, which I will paste to the clipboard. On the left computer, there is now a message stating that a remote assistance request has been received and do I want to allow it. Once I select yes, the computer on the right side will be able to see the desktop of the computer on the left. Notice that when I open Windows Explorer on the left screen, you can see it on the right. However, if I go to the right computer and attempt to open any programs, I will not be able to. By default, Remote Assistance will only allow the remote party to see the desktop. If they want control over the desktop, they need to select the option at the top, Request Control. When I select this, the computer on the left will get a message saying the computer on the right would like control of the desktop. Notice also the tick box, Allow Admin to Respond to User Account Control Prompts. If this option is ticked, if the remote party attempts to perform an action that requires a user account control prompt, they will be able to accept it. Otherwise, they will not. Once I press Yes, the computer on the right will now be able to open applications on the computer on the left. Remote assistance was built under the idea that you would be talking to the other party over the phone or some sort of teleconferencing. If you do not have this in place, you can always press the chat button to enable a chat session. Remote assistance is primarily designed for getting help when you need it from another party. If you want to remote control your computer, then Microsoft offers Remote Desktop. This allows you to take control of the keyboard and mouse on the remote computer, but in the process, 
it will lock the desktop of the computer. The idea behind Remote Desktop is that it allows you to access another computer from remote. For example, if you are at home and then realize you left an important file on the desktop of your computer at work, using Remote Desktop you could connect up to the computer at work from home and then email the file to yourself. If you start using Windows Server, Windows Server allows two remote desktop connections to one server at the same time and does not lock the server's desktop. In Windows 7, Remote Desktop was designed to allow a user the ability to control their PC but not share the PC with others. Also, by locking the computer when you connect also stops someone using your computer while you are accessing it. You can only access Windows 7 computers using Remote Desktop that are running professional, enterprise, or ultimate editions. Keep in mind that the client used to access Remote Desktop can run on any edition of Windows. Let's have a look at how to configure and use Remote Desktop on Windows 7. First of all, I need to configure this computer to accept Remote Desktop connections. This is done in the same place as Remote Assistance. Open the control panel, go to System and Security, and then select Allow Remote Access. At the bottom are the Remote Desktop settings. By default, Windows will be set to Don't Allow Connections to this computer. The next option allows connections from computers that are running older remote desktop clients. This is less secure than the current client included in Windows 7. If you are only going to be connecting using Windows Vista or Windows 7, you can select the last option, which gives you the highest level of security. Once you have enabled Remote Desktop, you can next add users that will be able to access this computer by pressing the Select Users button. Notice at the top that the Administrators group is allowed access via Remote Desktop by default. I will be using an Administrator account to connect to this computer, so I won't add any users. Once I exit out, Remote Desktop is configured and ready to accept connections. To demonstrate connecting up to Remote Desktop, I will change to another Windows 7 computer. I will leave this computer in a reduced view in the top right hand corner so you can see what happens when I connect. First I will run Remote Desktop Connection from the Start menu. Next I need to enter in the computer that I am going to connect to. Notice that under the options I can also save the connection to the computer for use later. Once I have everything configured, I can press the Connect button to start a Remote Desktop Connection. To my Windows 7 computer. The first message I will get is asking if I trust this connection to be made. Next I will be asked which username and password I will be using to access the computer. Since I do not have certificates set up on this network, the remote desktop connection cannot verify the remote computer's identity. This is normal, so I will press Yes. You will notice now that the remote connection will start up and display the desktop of the other Windows 7 computer. Notice also in the top right hand corner the other computer desktop has now locked itself. This means that while you are using remote desktop no one will be able to sit in front of the screen of the other computer and see what is going on. Notice also that the desktop has gone black and looking glass effects have been disabled. Remote desktop has disabled these to reduce the amount of data traveling over the network and thus speed up the responsiveness of the remote desktop. Any program that I launch now will run on the remote computer. I can also access all the hard disks and any drive connected to the computer such as the DVD drive or USB drives. Once I am finished, all I need to do is log off the connection from the start menu. If I now right click on the remote desktop connection I saved earlier, I can select Edit and change the properties of the connection. On the Display tab, you can change the display that is used in Remote Desktop. Full screen is the default, but you will find that if you start using Remote Desktop to administer servers, 
you may want to reduce the size of the remote desktop so you can display more than one on the screen and swap between them like you would an application. Down at the bottom, you can also change the color depth. The higher the color depth, the more data that needs to be transferred over the network. If you are running remote desktops over a slow connection, you will notice the difference if you reduce the number of colors. On the Local Resources tab, you can configure which resources on the local computer will be available to remote desktop. For example, you may decide you want to use the local speakers and a microphone on your computer over the remote desktop connection. However, if sound is not required, it is best to switch it off as it reduces the speed of your connection. Down at the bottom of the screen, you can decide if your local printers will be available to the remote connection. This means you can open a document on the remote computer and have it print on your local computer. You can also disable the clipboard. The clipboard allows you to copy and paste information from your local computer to the remote computer using remote desktop. If you are using a slow link, accidentally copying or pasting a large amount of data via the clipboard can cause your connection to stall while the clipboard is being transferred over the network. If I select the More button, you can also configure the local drives to be available to the remote computer. This is a good setting to switch on if you need to copy files between the remote computer and your local computer. On the Experience tab, you can optimize what is transferred over the connection. Currently, it is set to low speed broadband, and that is why the desktop background and looking glass effects were disabled. It is just a matter of selecting the option that best matches the speed of your network. In this case, I will select the last option, LAN, since both these computers are connected to the same local area network. If I now save the settings and press Connect again, a remote desktop session will be started, and this time the connection is optimized for LAN use. Once logged in, you can see the desktop background has returned. 